hello everyone. Hello, Kara. Hello, Abisha. Hello, M. Like <laughs> via recording. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> M. So do you, so I guess I could introduce Em since she's not here. She's actually the executive director of Sustainable Seattle. And um, this project, BIPOC Sustainable Tiny Art House Community is, and we call it STAT for short, the acronym, um, is actually a program of their, our fiscal sponsor. We're a program of their Interweave pro project. So they have a bunch of projects like ours that they fiscally sponsor. So just so that you understand that relationship. And maybe Abisha, could you give her a little bit of understanding about, well, you might already know about the EDI because you work for the city, but maybe just like a little bit of background about um, how you're starting to transition in and Nick is transitioning out. And that's why we have two people or I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> um, complicated shuffling going on. Um, so Erica, I, as I mentioned, I'm doing out of class with the EDI team. I'm mostly working on the Red Barn Ranch. I'm not sure if, you, if you're familiar with it, but it's um, a 40 acre plot of land that's in Auburn that's, um, even though it's outside the city's jurisdiction, it's actually owned by the city. Um, so in, it's considered surplus property right now. So Parks wants to figure out what to do with it um, and wants to take an equitable approach to that. So I'm supporting that. But while I'm doing that, I, it, that doesn't take up all of my time. So I'm supporting the EDI team with some project management. Um, and I'm familiar with the EDI process because I used to be on the EDI advisory board. So I, it just made some <laughs> it made sense. Um, so I'm supporting with some of the capacity building. And um, I think I'm mostly doing capacity building uh projects so supporting them with the um with those projects and nick is actually going on uh paternity leave so i'm taking over for some of his projects through the end of the year um i believe it's through the end of the year so that's how i'm, I'm here and um this is one of the projects that i'm working on wait and so um super Avisha, thank you that's helpful and if, if you don't if you can humor me for just a few minutes so uba is back Right? Uba's back. Okay, yay. Yes. Um, and so do you report to her who, so Julia, Michael, who else is on the EDI team right now? Um, I report to Uba. Um, so the team is Michael, me, uh, Patrice, Julia, um, Andrew. Oh my gosh, I'm forgetting a couple of people. It's Andrew uh, Chan? What was that? Andrew Tran? Yeah, Andrew Tran. He's 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 part-time at uh, part of part-time with the EDI team and I think part-time with another team. And then um, David, I believe. Um, who else is this? Yeah. I'm so, I'm only I'm only 2 months in. Uh, David uh, Goldberg. Mm -hmm. And Katie is in it. Nick is um, also part of it because he's, I think, working on, um, uh, as I mentioned, part of the, some of the projects. Uh, I think he's taken on a couple of projects. So those are the f uh, EDI team. Cool. Helpful. Thank you. I know there was some shuffling. And, you know, when you're not yeah. in the office, I lose track of who is yeah. where and doing what. And even in the office, OPCD is in a whole other building. So I never know what's going on over there. <laughs> is that in the SMT building? Okay. <laughs> what, what building are you guys? Is, uh, yeah. oh, it's well, I'm at my parents' house in Seattle, <laughs> but um, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're on the when when we are in the office, um, we're on the 57th floor of S SMT. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, awesome. Um, great Thank views. You. A lot of elevators to ride with a lot of people. Oh, right yeah. Ooh, I don't know. Girls, if you ever go, it's a lot of elevators. <laughs> yeah. And someday we'll be back there and Carol, we will show you the view from the 57th floor. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> let, me, let me do just a quick 30 second intro on me. So I'm at the Office of Housing. I am the home ownership person. I've been there about four years, going on five. My background though to date has been 25 years of nonprofit community land trust, permanently affordable home ownership, community-based work, regional work, and then national work. So community land trusts are like 
kind of my narrow niche and awesome. is really is what I'm funding now. Um, quick primer on the Office of Housing. We're about 40 people. The lion's share are focused on funding um, the development of permanent supportive housing and affordable rental. So we don't own, operate, or manage any of our own housing. We are policy people, lenders, and funders. And there's about one and a half, maybe two full-time equivalent humans that work in the home ownership space. So that's sort of just for context there. Um, and Carol, give me, give me your intro. Like who is staff? You, you gave me sort of the structure. Talk to me about the humans. Right. So um, BIPOC stack, it's a, a brown, indigenous, people of color, sustainable, tiny art house community um, project, experiment, pilot um, model of community development that is from the ground up, grassroots, basically. Um, I basically have um, had a lot of experience with displacement and gentrification personally, and not only in my own personal family and me, myself, um, being priced out of Seattle, um, but also with probably 80 to 85% of the artists that I know that are of color that can no longer afford to live in Seattle. And because of that, I am now actually living part of the year. I just moved to Texas a month and a half ago because my building and the I, and I was living in affordable housing in the Tashiro Kaplan artist loft, but they were raising the rent again. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it is in the heart of pollution zone, Pl air pollution, land, wa our water pollution, land pollution, sound pollution, um, every kind of pollution you can think of, that building's got it, um, transit, everything. And so, uh, and because there was a lot of, um, like, drug use, a lot of people doing crazy stuff around the building. I just decided that I, I couldn't create and I couldn't be there any longer. But for the past year when COVID hit, I decided that, um, I, you know, COVID was a very lonely time for me, um, having autoimmune disease and being having to stay in the house all the time. Um, I decided that I wanted to create something that could be sustainable long term, not only for myself and my family, but also for other artists that were experiencing the same thing that I was experiencing, the shock of like entering the central district and every single thing has changed or, um, you know, Westlake, everything has changed. <laughs> like, like having this major shock of like, oh my gosh, I am so disoriented, right? Well, how can I create an actual intentional community? And I actually um, experienced that at the Tashiro Kaplan on some level, but the challenge with that building was that when it was created, it was created by 10 people who literally were um, relocated from the 619 Western building, the very first original art building in Seattle, by the city and paid to like move into this building. They created a structure, but the infrastructure was not sound, right? So they didn't create, they had a, a, a committee, but they didn't create an intentional community around that committee. And so by the time I moved in, which is maybe 15 years later, nobody's talking, people are arguing, you know, it's just, it's just a very toxic place inside and outside. And so all of these things, and I had been researching, like, I want to go live in a tree house, or maybe I'll try and live in a tiny house, or, you know, like, I had been researching all these things around how can I get land cheaply, how can I live, like, within my own means, yet still build wealth creation, not only for me, but be able to, like, give a legacy or something to my kids, right? Um, and for other people. And so all of a sudden, after like having COVID hit, um, it came to me that, oh my gosh, I could literally like buy a cheap property of land somewhere and put some houses on it and build a community for artists. And I proposed this idea to a friend of mine. And at the time they were like, Carol, that's a crazy idea. <laughs> you know, like, what are you thinking, right? And so I, 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 I let it percolate a little bit more, but then by the end of 2020, that was when COVID hit, it was like November, 
a different friend approached me and I said, you know, I had this crazy idea. I kind of been percolating around. I want to run it by you. And I ran it by him. And he was like, here, I'm going to give you $14,000 to like set this off. And I was like, really? And he was like, don't tell anybody to give it to you. It's donated money. And, and what happened at that same, in the same month was that Sustainable Seattle was actually working. They had been percolating this idea of being fiscal sponsors for somebody, right? And so M approached me and was like, we would like to test this out on you. Would you like to be the first project? And so we just, you know, and went full head. And then, um, one of the ways that all of this is able to work is that I've built a partnership with, um, so one of the reasons it took so long is because I had been researching for about three years, tiny spaces, right? And like I said, at first I was like, I'm just going to go live in the woods and live in a tree house. And then I was like, that's actually not very realistic because the kind of tree house I want is going to cost like $300,000, you know? <laughs> and, so, and then so I start researching tiny houses. And for about three years, I'm, you know, watching these shows and all this stuff. And then what I realized is like for a really nice tiny house, one that has a kitchen, a living room, a bedroom, and possibly two bedrooms or three bedrooms, it's going to cost anywhere from 100000 upwards, right? So then I started thinking, how can I make this affordable? How can I make this so that it is tailored to middle to low income artists of color? And I came across this um, site called Arch Cabins, and I started watching their videos, and I contacted them, and I was like, what's your mission? We had a really long meeting with them, and in and all this stuff and come to find out our missions are directly in alignment. So they're parallel. The reason they created their arch cabins was for the same reason that I'm trying to create a community of artists. Um, and so they have agreed to actually tailor our first tiny house to the land that we were given. So we were given this piece of land, not um, on paper, but to lease for a year to show what we could do, right? And to show the possibility and have this tiny house um, kind of be like a pilot or like a, a site where people can come and see the actual tiny house. Because one of the challenges that I've been coming up against is that folks are like, when, when you say tiny house in Seattle, I, when I say it anywhere else in the country, people are like, yeah, let's do it, right? Um, but when I say it in Seattle, people think of Nicholsville, and they're like, ew, like, I'm not trying to go there. And so I had, I've been having these conversations with a lot of folks in Seattle around, I just need to buy one. I just need to have one on the property, even if it's the smallest one, so that people can understand that it's not the same as a regular house. So... Partnering with them has been able to cut the price down to building completely for twenty thousand dollars, twenty to thirty thousand dollars with the largest because the largest one is like thirteen thousand dollars. But then we build out the inside, and so the idea is that we build out the inside with upcycled, recycled, sustainable materials, um, and there is an interior design slash architect on our team that has access to real estate stuff where she gets like shelving and 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 all kinds of stuff, bathroom stuff, all kinds of stuff. Um, so that's the idea: is that um, and the actual arch cabin itself lasts the length of a traditional house. It can be put on um, post and beam. It can be put on foundation. It can be, you know, um, put on a trailer. It can be, there are multiple ways you can use it. It, ha it has um, R15, which I think is like the highest grade installation possible. The paint itself that they put on the outside is paint is, um, sustainable and but long-term um, insulation proof um, and you can tailor it to how you want it. They have multiple floor plans so you can have one floor, you can have two floors, you can have one bedroom, you can have you know um, you can put in a wood stove, you don't have to have a wood stove, it can you know. So all of these things made it so appealing to me to try it out um, and then we applied for a couple grants and we did get um, some grants from the EDI, so Seattle Foundation, Rachel's Network, um, and a couple other places. This, I think we got the C grant too. Um, and so with that piece in place, 
The other piece that I also wanted to use as an experiment was this idea that there are so many people of color in my community that have skill sets, but they don't have a resume. They don't have a degree. They don't have a certification, right? And there are artists that have businesses, but are struggling with these businesses because they can't afford their house or they can't afford to build their business substantially and sustainably the way that they want to, right? And so I decided that I would through I would shift the hiring model on its head. And so I don't necessarily look at resumes. I don't really care what you look like on paper. The first question that I ask people is, are you willing to learn? Are you willing to grow? Are you willing to invest in your community? And those are the three major questions that I ask folks. Um, and so with shifting that, people are hired as consultants. So I'm a consultant. Everybody's a consultant. It's a horizontal um, business model in terms of I am the lead consultant, so I keep all the pieces together, but I don't make all the decisions. And I don't want to make all the decisions. I don't want to be the person that holds everything in the organization. I want every I want other people to be able to take a leadership role and grow in this role and actually be part of a collective decision making body. Um, and so right now I I'm taking a, a course on sociocracy in order to learn that whole model of how do we make decisions collectively where I'm not I'm not an executive director because I don't want to be an executive director. I've been an executive director numerous times. I've been a manager. I the, it's not. I'm not into the industrial complex model of, for any level, like education, healthcare, art, none of it. And so I decided that we would hire people and they would start at $25 an hour part time. And for the first year to year and a half, it's treated like a training or employment model where they literally learn everything there is to learn about tiny houses. They learn everything there is to learn about community development, marketing, whatever their niche and they're interested in. I try to provide resources and access to that through um, not only the stuff that I know, because I have a huge long history in employment and career development, working in education and working with employment programs and all this stuff anyway. so. And I was a real estate agent, so I have a I have a very extensive background. My master's is in organizational development, where I'm really interested in shifting paradigms and systems, systems theories, right? Um, Sounds like you're doing. Yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> um, and so I'm really trying to figure out like these two pieces: housing coupled with professional development and employment, so that. Folks can put those together and shift towards wealth generation, even if it's just a small amount, even if they can only like sell the house in 20 years or 10 years for $50,000 and do what they need to do by maybe paying for an education or paying for whatever their family needs or keep it long term, give it to your family, right? Um, and I'm also looking at land trusts because um, I know I've been, I don't know if you know Gus Newport. He, yes, so he and I have, um, about two years ago, we were working on a project together and he told me about the project that he had created almost 40 years ago and how now that city has come to that project and said, how can we actually do this elsewhere? And I, you're talking Dudley Street. Yes, Dudley Street. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was just like, oh my gosh, this is so juicy. This is what I want. <laughs> and so now I'm actually like, how can I create a land trust with these tiny houses? And the model, there's three different ways to do it. So there's where we're given land with no house on it. That would mean in the city of Seattle, um, according to zoning and permitting, you'd have to build a main structure that is the largest structure and then create ADUs around it. So the tiny houses would be the ADUs and the largest tiny house would be the shared space, which is like 24 by 30 feet, I think. Something like that, it's pretty big. Um, and then oh, that's the first model. The second model is that 
you have a piece of land with an actual house on it, right? And then you put the ADUs around it. The third model is that you actually have, um, like you work with an agency. So like if Seattle Parks is interested in working or partnering, they would give me a park. We would build tiny houses in that park and create an art community for all the patrons that utilize that park. Or the same with like a church, right? Like a church mm -hmm. who has like major parking spaces, but they don't want to use it for that anymore or they have a portion they want to, you know, whatever. So those are the three models that I'm working with. And currently I've partnered with the Seattle, Southeast Seattle Foundation, Curtis Brown, I don't know if you know him. Um, he, Seattle, South Seattle Foundation owns five acres of land in Southeast Seattle over um, in the Brighton development area. And he came to me early on um, because I was a part of this group called Community Organized Resource Development, where all, it was like 25 people of color that are interested in purchasing and buying land and doing a, doing a lot of the similar stuff, but on a massive scale. And I'm not really interested in density like that. Um, but anyway, so he came to me and he was like, we would like to give you half an acre, which is now currently being used as a park and it has a pea patch next to it. Um, and then what ended up happening is that four or five months into that, um, he realized that his board could not get on board with that idea because they saw it as a risk and they couldn't envision tiny houses, right? They kept thinking a Nicholsville, basically. <laughs> right, right, right. And so he came to me in June of this year and said, look, we actually own a house instead of the half acre let's start with the house you can put two to three tiny houses on the house and show us what you can do with community development all that stuff so that's this where i'm at the, right now this is the 4627 exactly okay. yep cool. so that's where i'm at right now and i told him i asked him at that time i was like and we have been in conversation ever since i just applied for the other edi and i didn't get it but it i applied with it i applied to it with the understanding that he is on board that if i want to buy that house under bipoc stack he's willing to let like they're open they're totally open to that um which is why i was I, I wasn't really sure if i wanted to actually lease the property um but with that understanding from him, I was like, okay, let's just take the leap. Let's just lease it for a year, see what we can do. And that's where I'm at right now is we're about to open next week. Actually, I just finished the press release. Um, we have three tiny homes coming. One is going to be put in the backyard. The smallest, smallest one is going to be put in the front yard, like a, um, and it's going to be a like a, a sauna spot for two to three or four people. So it invites people into the property. And then the third tiny house is actually going to the Bellevue Art Museum because the actual community development model of this got accepted into their architectural um, exhibition in November. So that tiny house is going to be there from November to April. So that's where I'm. That's yeah. That was a really long, bleh. <laughs> no, that was that was a great background. I have got so many like popcorn. Oh, hey, it's Nick. Sorry, hey, Nick. we're recording. Just so you know, Nick. <laughs> Don't say anything you regret. No. Yeah. I <laughs> so I always, just got always a good rule. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just got the super background from Carol and now my brain is exploding. Um, and I actually just had a good old friend drop some things off. I'm at my parents' house anyway, you know, COVID, life, etc. Um, oh my God, so many. Okay, so questions first. Um, so you didn't get the last round of EDI, but you do have some EDI from past rounds? Okay, and still money in the bank from that ca capacity building? Right. Okay. Um, three tiny homes coming, what, this week, you said? November. 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 So I just got the email last week that they are actually shipping them out November 8th. Awesome. Um, 
Okay, Gus Newport, Curtis Brown, I need to figure out, not figure out. Uh, I want to learn more about Southeast Seattle Foundation. So they actually have transitioned now. Okay. So because of what happened with our project and them, he decided that he actually wanted to change the organization. So their name has now changed to the Brighton Development Group, and they are actually focused on land purchasing now. They're literally like, he's going in a completely different direction. He wants to include elders, but he also wants young folks. So, and folks of color. Yeah. Um, just recently did that, just so you know. So if you type in, yeah. so you'll we'll get, probably get both of those names. <laughs> Oh, cool, cool. Um, so, so a, f a few things. Let me let me back up and with my office of housing hat on, tell you about how our funding works, and then I want to tell you with my Erica hat on about like community land trusts and different layers of where I could see pieces fitting in, and then questions I have. Um, okay. So, office of housing has housing development subsidy. Um, the tiny home, I mean, it would be an interesting question. If it's on a chassis, we can't fund it. If it's on a foundation, we could. So that's sort of one just factoid <laughs> to think about. Um, mortgage lending. So, so the way it's so all, sorry taking a breath. The way our program normally works, I'll tell you sort of the bread and butter and then we can think about how or if there need to be change, there would need to be changes to fund the project, the development typology that you are all considering are in fact putting on the ground very soon. Um, so we have two funding sources for home ownership. One is a down payment assistance model which is a home buyer uh, gets pre-approved for a mortgage. They then through mostly home site, some the Washington State Housing Finance Commission. So we don't directly administer our funds. We have a pass-through intermediary. Then they have $55,000 of city funding with which they can go shopping on the open market. That can be a home that exists right now, it could be a brand new tiny home. So down payment assistance is one avenue. There are very few, there are fewer strings attached to that money. There's no restrictions on resale, but if and when a home buyer, home owner then who use down payment assistance sells their home, they then pay the city back plus a little bit of interest or if they refinance. Okay, so there's one sort of path. Um, to access resources from a home buyer perspective. The second is what we call development subsidy. That's a much larger amount. So for a two bedroom or fewer, that's $100,000 per home. For three bedrooms or more, that's $130,000 per home. Um, now the strings attached with that is that's a permanent investment from the city but the home then is resale restricted, much like a community land trust does. Others, other types of organizations do permanent affordable home ownership as well. Habitat for Humanity, um, for example. Ooh, that was the other thing I thought of. They have a very cool new project just sold and was dedicated to 13 households in South Park, wherein they it, it was zoned RSL and they did principal, Adu and Dadus on each of the lots. They do not feel tiny for sure. They are two story, three bedroom townhomes, um, but they, it's so lovely. <laughs> They've got a big tree and a, a grassy area in the middle. It is relatively dense. You had spoken Carol earlier to density. So it would be interesting just to even lay eyes on that and like, what is that? potential because they they very much utilized a very cool zoning situation that Nick might have had. Um, so and is it completed Erica? Is that what you're saying? It is completed and wow. sold and I will send you a link to a set of uh, 
photos at the yeah, dedication. Please. I wasn't able to go, but Emily and Lori were both there and they both were like, oh, that's so That's good. awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so there's that. So the Adu Dadu principal residence thing is exciting uh, as an opportunity. So that funding source you know, we're, we're conservative, we're a government entity with, you know, the public tax dollars that we are stewarding. Um, so, I mean, I can send you the application that that currently, uh, you know, is a development pro forma and, you know, uh, title insurance and a survey and all the developery things um, and hoops that, you know, appraisals that are, you know, in excess of the cost of the project, etc. cetera. Um, let me actually take a tangent to make a quick distinction between permanently affordable home ownership and community land trusts. And it sounds like what your, I mean, you started with the words pilot, experiment, model, approach. A community land trust is a type of organization that is built to hold land in trust for a variety of community needs. They sometimes utilize a ground lease to ensure ongoing affordability. They sometimes use other legal tools. A community land trust is not a project. Um, it is a going concern that has membership and tripartite board structure. I mean, it sounds like your vision could be really paired for such a thing. Um, there is always a balancing act between are we collectively in this for the long term versus let's see how this works, <laughs> you know, and um, there are going to be different decisions that you all will need to make along the way, depending on your answers to those questions. And there will definitely, from a funding perspective, be different questions and answers that I will have depending on your answers to those questions, um, if that wasn't too opaque. Um, but man, this sounds exciting. That's the upshot of my emotional response to all of what you've just shared and all of the massive amount of work that you have put into this, Carol. Um, kudos and thank you and how exciting. So this, so the 2627, 4627 property, you have a lease currently. How long is that lease for? Till May of next year. And so who will own, okay, so Brighton Development Group owns the land. BIPOC stack under the umbrella of sustainable Seattle is the lessee currently. And who then owns the structures slash who decides who gets to live there and how does all that work? So I do. So I have my, um, what is it called, site control? So okay. we, but BIPOC stack owns the tiny houses that are coming. Okay. Which is under Sustainable Seattle. Um, and they, the one in the back is actually going to be put on um, foundation. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that answers the question. Yep, yep, yep. Um, and so, is there a, well, I guess not having M here. I mean, I want, so sustainable Seattle's interest is just sort of mission alignment and and probably the same reaction that I'm having is like, this sounds amazing. Let's figure out how to support this effort. Great. Okay. But you don't have a board or- We have a board they have a board and the way that their fiscal sponsorship works is that so the person that i just spoke of who is actually um the interior designer slash tiny house 
kind of specialist person um, is the person who is on their board. So with their fiscal sponsorship, um, they have a board member participate in one of their interweave projects, programs or whatever. I, I'm not really sure what to call this. I, that's why the, that's the, going back to what you were saying earlier, is this long-term or short-term projects or short-term. Mm -hmm. I really don't like the word project or program, but it's the only word that I can describe it. Mm -hmm. An, an initiative, is that something that rings true? Well, that's probably just as wonky and weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah fair enough. Um, work of art. <laughs> work of community. Yeah, we talked about that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Installation. <laughs> we talked about that too. <laughs> yeah. I like the installation part, um, but that also kind of speaks to short term. You know, I don't know. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And it might be short term because that's the other piece is that this house is really a teardown, and I don't really know that it should be the house that we purchase. You know, I just there's a lot of like unknowns around that as well. It's just kind of like yeah, I don't know. You know, um, what I really want is like lands like in Auburn that Abisha uh, just talked about, you know, like that would be dope, but I just don't see that happening right now. Seattle is too expensive. It's not going to, you know, and so that was the other piece of the model that Curtis Brown, the one who leased this house to us, had talked about was that if we join the Brighton Development Group, their concept is to purchase houses within the Brighton area and put this model on those houses, right? But then I would not have site control or, you know, and so that's the other piece is like. So when you when you say put this model on this on these houses, can you what what is the model? So the model is basically utilizing tiny houses to build wealth creation, but also um, sustainable business um, growth models, right? So basically, they're tiny communities of artists living together. It's almost like co-op model, um, except that they all have their own house. They don't, it's not mm -hmm. an apartment building where artists go in and they buy the building together and each one has their own apartment. This is more like they actually have their own house and they have a shared housing space or shared space, yeah. So there, so there's like three different layers I feel like that my, it might be helpful to sort of um, disentangle, right? Because mm -hmm. there's like co-op is an ownership structure. Condo is an ownership structure. Um, fee simple is a weird wonky as a former realtor you know what that is, ownership structure. You can use those legal tools on any buildings or building or, you know, uh, even, you know, squares of land if you wanted to. Like, it's all about how you legally divide the things. And then, like, the it sounds like, so wealth creation through ownership of something whether or not it's a tiny home or a leased lot or land, but also business development mm -hmm. is a thread there. I was sort of uh, looking at the chat here, the Cultural Space in uh, Agency. I, just, I love that name just generally. I don't actually know what that is, um, but Nick's going to educate me, I hope, soon. Cultural short, Space short version is it's a PDA. Yeah, it's a public development agency. They hold land in, um, they give it to the community for the use of cultural spaces. Their specific niche, but like the Pike Place Market is a PDA. That land. So is, so is Skipta and so is Community Roots. And so like even, even knowing it's a PDA still doesn't answer my question. <laughs> you know, like. I, I need to figure, I mean, I know Matthew and gosh, cultural space agency. I just picture satellites, right? And I'm like, space agency. His presentation on it is awesome because he goes into all this sci-fi oh, sort of motif. It's oh, really boy. fun. Is it recorded? Oh, I don't know. I mean, maybe there is a recorded version. I just mean the one that I've seen him give. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, so, I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of, 
potential capital C city collaboration that could happen around this concept. So I know that this is maybe, I'm, I'm maybe premature in asking this question, um, but as you, Carol, learn a little bit about the Office of Housing and what we might be able to offer. I mean, I'll be honest, we have a very narrow focus, right? Which is permanently affordable home ownership. It sounds like they are not necessarily incompatible and could be layered, um, like our resources could assist with the impact and the outcome that you're hoping to achieve. Um, given what you now know about OH, what role do you see us playing or how, how, do, I mean, do you even need our money and what would that look like? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, this is not something I've ever done before. So it's not like I actually even really deeply understand exactly what you do, even though you explained it to me. <laughs> a lot of people don't, a lot of people don't. <laughs> you know? um, My boss doesn't even. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so I was referred to you and I was told that you're a person that we really need to speak with. Um, um, and so I, I, I feel like the reason I said this is an experiment is because I'm walking through this in a way that it's going to happen if the community wants it to happen. It's not going to happen if I want it to happen, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not, and, the, and I, I sincerely mean that. And when I say if the community wants it, artists are going to have to be on board, the city's going to have to be on board, educators are going to have to be on board. There's a huge pie of like different entities that are going to have to like be on board to make it happen because it's not something i don't have the money to go in and buy a piece of property myself especially in seattle you know um, so it's not like i could just go buy a house and be like okay i'm gonna put up my own tiny houses i'm gonna stay for five years and then i'm gonna have like ten thousand dollars a house you know and then invite people in and create my own structure that's not how it's gonna work it's literally going to have to be like a community left. And so when you ask me, what do I need or what do we need? Um, I'm not sure, but money and land are huge on that list. They're probably the first top two things. <laughs> and I don't know how, how that's gonna happen. You know? Well, so let me, uh, so I guess that, that is totally fair. Um, Money and land. I wish I had it. I mean, I guess I do have some of it, but the money's yours. So, <laughs> um, okay, that's that's super helpful. Nick, look at you raising your hand. Well, I, yeah, I didn't. I don't know if this is helpful, and I know I came almost forty minutes late. So you might have described some of the opportunity here in these terms already. But I just your your question, Erica, made me think of whether it's helpful, not in the last minute that we have obviously, but you know, going forward to think about funding that could support the ongoing operation of the organization, similar to how the 2020 EDI capacity building grant was sustaining the, the initiative, so to speak, but not funding the big capital purchase. And then there's the purchase of land. I mean, I, I'm sort of seeing three like ways that the organization, the effort needs and could benefit from funding. Capacity building to just continue doing the work. Maybe these are in order of scale, I'm not sure. Acquisition money for property, for land. This gets to the, the two things, you know, that Carol just named that are at the top of the list. And then uh, subsidy for an actual permanent affordable home ownership project of some kind, which obviously it's, mm -hmm. needs to crystallize as a model. Uh, and I feel like I've been trying to think about what options, you know, OH being one of them potentially that, that Carol and the team could use for one or more of those. And, you know, EDI in the future could be another source, but 
Carol, I don't know if that sort of maps at all to how you think of it, but it seems like there are different needs for funding and obviously as a result, different potential funding sources for each. That's, that's Yes, you nailed it. Thank you, Nick, for jumping in. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the, the other thing that I, um, it's, uh, well, and maybe this is better as a, as a question, what I mean, I think Carol, you're right to say, right, that that it's not going to happen without the community. However, we choose to define that, wanting it to happen and working to make it happen. To what extent has there been sort of a community organizing effort slash, you know, how many BIPOC artists are involved, and is there sort of a groundswell, or what could that look like moving forward? So currently, I believe there are 15 artists that are actually signed up for a tiny house to purchase. And um, we've just launched the community. It's like a bi-weekly community update meeting. Um, and that was probably, we just launched that like three weeks ago. And so there's one artist that lives in Lake City that's interested, that has been coming on a consistent basis. Um, there, actually, no, there's two that are on that list that have been coming on a consistent basis. And then one showed up yesterday, but the meeting was canceled. It was her first meeting, unfortunately. So she has also started to get involved. Um, and then aside from that piece of it, um, the artist that is an artist in resident right now wants to purchase a tiny house. Um, the, and she is working with me to actually help bring in artists that are mentoring that we're mentoring into the project um that are also interested in purchasing their own house although they haven't filled out our actual form form um and so i also just had a meeting with seattle foundation they have a grant that's available at the end of this month um it's a really small grant it's like seven thousand dollars i think to do community something and so i had a conversation with them around what would really be cool is um one of our consultants is our programming person and her interest and we've been having these conversations about it would be really cool to find out who in the neighborhood owns a business owns a house is interested in this model and supporting it at some in some capacity and building community events around that so that it starts to bring in more artists and more people. Um, and so that is actually in the works that I'm gonna apply for the grant by the end of this month. So that's kind of where it is right now. And we've also had conversations I told, um, so the house that we're in is a three bedroom house and one bedroom, because I'm living part-time here in Texas, um, I, my plan is to live part-time in Seattle as well and stay in the third bedroom. But when I'm not there, we want to use, um, we built the model to use it as a um, Airbnb for artists of color that are coming from national places so that they can also learn about it, this model and the sustainable model and take it to other places, right? And talk about it and like get involved and move there if they want to move there, right? Um, and so we're actually, that piece is, we're just waiting on um, Sustainable Seattle's business piece of it to be able to apply for the city because now with the Airbnb model, you have to like have this license and all this other stuff. So that's where yeah. we're at. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm not even sure. I mean, yes, absolutely. And I don't even know what my questions are. I mean, my question for myself is how can we, we Office of Housing, me, Erica Malone, be supportive of this effort? And that's something I'm going to noodle on for a little bit. And I am so sorry, Carol, I have to run to my next meeting. Um, but gosh, I really appreciate you taking the time this morning to share all of your work with me and also just all of the work that you've been doing. And let's let's connect again. I'm gonna just think, <laughs> marinate oh, no, I in love some that. of this. <laughs> and, I think what would be a great next step is if you, I, Abisha, and M can have a meeting together. It'd be great for M to be here because I think she also holds a piece of like the information like Nick that I'm not able to articulate very well. <laughs> so it's maybe 
seems like the next step, you know? That sounds great. That sounds great. Well, and Em and I were in another gathering um, last Friday, I guess, the Puget okay. Sound Sage did a, a community stewardship of land gathering and, and um, I saw that she was there and I was like, oh yeah, that I need to, you know, there's just a lot of threads that need to sort of be pulled together. And so I, I will look forward to um, taking that next step. Awesome. Carol, thank you. We've got to run. Um, where, wait, where in Texas are you? Quinlan. I don't know where Quinlan is. It's like an hour outside of Dallas. All right. Well, uh, hope y'all are doing well. <laughs> that's, that's all I got for Texas. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs>